again in about one minute. morning slash good afternoon everybody thank you thank you all so much for joining us for this this third the the third of three sessions uh on race lighting people of color in schools colleges and universities for those of you that are joining us again uh welcome back for those that are joining for the first time welcome we are very very excited to have you here next slide so as those of you um who are familiar with uh, the, the way that we run these sessions. So Luke and I spend a little bit of time on the front end doing, a, doing some framing. And then um, today we are joined by a special guest as we were last week, uh, our colleague and friend and sister, Dr. Marissa Vasquez, who's an associate professor at SDSU in the College of Education and also this is a, the, uh, the associate director of research for the Community College Equity Assessment Lab. So we're very, very excited to hear from her. Next slide. As most of you know, uh, this program is being offered completely free to any colleague or student who wishes to participate. And that is due in uh, no small part to our colleagues at the College Futures Foundation who provided grant funding for us to develop this program. Uh, there's also an opportunity to earn continuing education units for those who are interested. We'll share more information about that at the end of today's session. And uh, we want to give a very, very, very special shout out to our program officer, Sean Whaling, who's been a um, great supporter of us, great supporter of our work, and most importantly, just a wonderful thought partner in everything that we've done. So thank you so much, Sean. Um, and then before I turn it over to Luke, I want to thank some of our other colleagues and organizations that have um, supported this, uh, particularly in helping us get the word out for their collaboration and support. And of course, uh, it's the colleagues at Diverse Issues of Higher Education, uh, the California State University System, the Education Trust West, and the California Community College Chancellor's Office. We appreciate you. We are grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next slide, we'll talk about some of the program objectives. And this is not specifically for today's session, but this is for the, the uh, four-part online program, which we'll talk about towards the end of today's session. But if you decide to participate in this program, here are some of the, the things you can expect to learn from it. So you'll learn about uh, race lighting and its primary objectives. You'll learn about uh, microaggressions and uh, how some of the most prevailing and persistent microaggressions that are present in experiences of uh, Black and Indigenous people of color in education, you know, how race lighting is connected to those, those experiences. We'll talk about how race lighting is associated with other unhealthy outcomes, so student success outcomes, uh, career advancement and success, to name some. And then finally, and probably most important, is uh, you will be able to devise strategies for addressing race lighting at both the institutional and the personal level. And we're going to spend some time in today's session talking about what exactly can institutions do in order to address race lighting. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my my guy, Luke, and then uh, he will take us from there. All right, well, it's good to see uh, everyone uh, who joined us today. Thank you so much. Um, as Frank mentioned, uh, there are two different components to this. So we're doing these live sessions talking about uh, the impact that uh, race lighting um, has on uh, people of color. And so in addition to these live sessions, there's also the uh, course where you can receive uh, two free CEUs. Um, you can see that's uh, 20 uh, total hours of, of, of work. 
And if you participated in the live sessions, you've already uh, gone part of the way in terms of, uh, of, of completing that. And so if anybody's interested in doing that, you just go to corelearning.org and click on courses and then go to race lighting. And then you can have an opportunity to uh, engage in this class. We hope that you'll participate since you've already been part of this. We hope that you'll encourage your, your campuses to participate, your students, your faculty, your staff. This is meant to be an open uh, resource for anyone who wants to learn more about uh, the race lighting experience. And as Frank mentioned, this is a project that was funded by the College Futures Foundation. In addition to that, we've also set up an additional resource at racelighting.net where you can get an overview of race lighting, look at works that have been written. And in fact, uh, Frank and I just had an article that just came out uh, this past week, and we'll send that out next week in the Community College Journal Research and Practice uh, talking about race lighting. Uh, you can learn about some definitions, see uh, videos, and then there's also, in addition to that, as we mentioned before, the race lighting lesson plan, where if you are having a conversation and you want to have people be able to engage in a guided lesson plan with videos and questions uh, organized around, uh, around race, race lighting, uh, this is kind of like a one-stop area to be able to do that. Uh, there's an intro video, there's a story about ja Jacob and Jazz where you play it uh, and then at different parts you stop that video and then there's guiding questions that we have that are associated with it. Uh, that lesson plan was put together by myself and Frank, Idara Essien, and Tina King. And then so what we're going to do today is we're going to begin before we get into the comments and commentary with a video. And what this video does is it is it talks about um, the experiences that uh, that men of color in particular have uh, with race lighting. Now, as we play this, one thing that we want to make uh, uh, clear is that men of color are certainly not the only group that, that experiences race lighting, uh, but we use um, um, this as an example of some of the unique experiences that do play out that do have a disproportionate impact on our minoritized communities. And so we're gonna begin by, by playing this video to kind of have an idea of how people are experiencing um, race lighting. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cue this up and get this going. So one moment. I mean, he, he denied, uh, we, we had our, our dean at one point uh, call one of our other faculty members uh, up and And a student worker overheard the conversation. The student worker quit the next day because of what was said. And then denied it. Right, the, the, the dean end up all of a sudden retiring, and then six months later wanted to come back and do some work. But the new dean we had in says no because we know the incident that took place. Like all this stuff was, and and the fact that they have the goal to say, oh, it was just a comment or, or I didn't say it or deny things. It's like th there are witnesses, and you can still deny stuff like it never existed and make it out as though we're crazy. So these incidents happen so much that you, you can't feel nothing but like, man, it's just me. And you start you start internalizing that stuff and feeling like, yeah, I'm just, I, I'm too sensitive. Maybe it's me. Maybe I just need to deal with it. I need to look at it from the, I, I need to look at it from the other side. Dealing with a student who wanted to complain about how they were treated by a faculty member. Um, some of the things that they felt the faculty member said to them were inappropriate and the student wasn't comfortable with what was said to them. But when I heard the faculty side of the story, instead of addressing or saying that they did or did not say these things, it was more along the lines of putting the blame back on the students and saying that they were a disciplinary problem or, you know, the student was hard to manage. 
or the student had issues following directions or they were being unruly in the classroom environment. That, that definitely comes to mind where, you know, you complain about a certain issue and then somehow some way it's turned back uh, in your direction and is made, you're made to seem as if you were the problem and the problem originated with you or you were the reason why you're experiencing these things. Usually when someone fires back at you or says that you're not feeling it correctly or you're thinking about it wrong, there's, I think there's always going to be a tendency to, to second guess yourself or to doubt whether or not your feelings were authentic or that they were justified. It's constant, it's daily. I could be on the job for four or five years or I've had 11 years, 12 years of higher ed experience and still people will say you're, you're new to your role. Um, just omit things that I've actually worked on. I've, I've, I've been in rooms where I've worked on something and people will constantly, this is pretty routine, constantly thank everyone. And then they say, oh yeah, thank, you know, you know, me or so on and so forth. Um, if I refer to something or refer to someone, um, there's a challenge. Uh, in the room when, or in a, a Zoom atmosphere, every question or any question that I pose sometimes it becomes it, it, it becomes an awkward exchange almost as if the person is trying to explain to me what they're actually talking about as if i don't get what they're talking about again we go back to trying to re-explain to me something that i i already know questioning uh decisions that i may make and but in a polite way it, it runs the gamut it runs it goes it goes from something as small as me having administrative position and someone who works, you know, someone who reports to me who happens to be not black, that folks will come into our space and ask that person questions as if I am the one reporting to that particular person. This happens all the time, even though I'm dressed a certain way. I'm, st I'm dressed a certain way, but you still refer your questions to someone who reports to me. Things like that, it, it constantly happens. So we're thinking about things that we think about, that we think about. And by the time you even get to a conversation that some folks can just simply have, I'm already dealing with a whole set of circumstances and lived experience that doesn't put us on equal footing when we're talking. Because I didn't understand the concept of being at the table, the seat at the table. You know, you start thinking that these folks that you're working with are somehow so knowledgeable and so, you know, um, bright and intellectual. And so now you're dealing with a whole set of problems where other folks may not respect you for whatever preconceived notions they may have. You don't have enough experience. Uh, you know, you 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 were given something. So you're trying to navigate these waters and still work on yourself in terms of your self-confidence in these spaces. I don't know if that ever stops. I don't know if it ever truly stops. I think it lessens. So as you can see from that video, it talked about um, a number of different experiences with different um, types of microaggressive experiences and then how those uh, influenced um, people to then begin to second guess their own lived experiences, realities, capabilities, knowledge, and decision making. Um, we have a longer version of that video that then links and shows how that then translated into these same individuals experiencing um, what would be described as racial battle fatigue, which was talked about last week with our guest, uh, Dr. Uh, William Smith from the University of Utah. And so what um, we're going to do now, I'm going to turn it over to Frank, and he's going to talk about what are some of the things that we can do in response to race lighting. Um, and really, that's the, the focus of, of today's session is really thinking about recommendations, next steps of what should be happening 
um, so that people can gain more of a sense of control over this, both personally and uh, what institutions can can do to address these issues. So, Frank, turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Luke. And while we're we're getting the uh, PowerPoint back up on the screen, um, understand that. So these campus responses that we're going to be sharing. Uh, they're directly related to race lighting, but some of them are gonna be more about what campuses can do to address racism and racial microaggressions, right? Which we know are directly related to and contribute to experiences with race lighting. And so uh, just be mindful of that as we run run through these. Luke, I'm not, uh, I'm seeing, a, a, I got a black screen on my end. Um, so okay, let me, let me try to reshare then. Yeah. And uh, just as a heads up, for everybody, there's about there's about ten different um, strategies we're going to share with regard to campus campus responses to race lighting. So just to give you an idea of uh, what we'll be doing, and then from there we'll transition to our conversation with Dr. Vasquez. Yeah, just a moment, Frank. Yeah. Can you see it now? Uh, yep, yep, we are good to go now. All right. So uh, first thing uh, is to ask and believe what Black and Indigenous people of color say uh, in response to their experiences with lace lighting. Right? So Luke and I, over the years, uh, we've always talked about lifting minoritized voices, providing spaces and opportunities for folks who are directly targeted and experience racism uh, to give them an opportunity to share their experiences and to actually believe what they say. Now, over the years, uh, he and I, and I, you know, Dr. Vasquez as well, we've been involved in inquiries where institutions have asked folks about their experiences, and when they weren't necessarily happy with what they've heard, they've actually questioned um, and made them feel as though their experiences are not valid and not real, right? Which actually triggers a race lighting experience when that occurs, right? But it's important to not only provide space and opportunities for folks to share what they're experiencing. And we're going to actually talk about some ways that that could happen systematically. But equally important is to actually believe what they say when they share their experiences. Uh, second is to express authentic care, right? When we know that, um, you know, communities or individuals have experienced race lighting, uh, it's important to, to make sure that when we express care and concern that it's authentic and that it's real, right? That it comes from an authentic place. Uh, and this is important when we're talking about dealing with, with acts of, you know, uh, racial microaggressions, for example, that might be more locally and personally experiences, experienced, but also when we're thinking about how campuses respond to, to uh, local and national acts and crises that target specific uh, communities, for example. And so being able to express care and express it in a real authentic way is important in that regard. Uh, third, campuses should make sure that all educators have the capacity and the professional learning that they need to advance racial equity, uh, regardless of whatever position they hold at the institution. So this is important for all educators, not just for faculty members and not just for colleagues who hold leadership positions. Right? Everybody should know um, and have some sense, at least some baseline knowledge and understanding and some very uh, basic strategies on the things that they can do from their positions in order to help uh, advance racial equity at the institution. Uh, next slide. Some campuses have found it uh, particularly useful to establish uh, a bias response reporting system, and this is in a system. This is a system where members of the campus community can anonymous, anonymously report bias-related acts that have ex they have experienced or observed. So, a system like this not only gives campus leaders a heads up on bias incidents and an opportunity, perhaps, to address them proactively and in a timely manner. But it also provides an important source of real-time data and uh, some idea what are some of the notable trends that are occurring with regard to bias within the institution, right? And this could be related to racism. It could be related to, uh, you know, uh, bias against LGBTQIA homophobia, uh, for example. And so any type of bias that might be, be present and experienced can be shared within the system. Uh, of course, if you have such a system like this, it's important to make sure that it's being regularly monitored and that uh, colleagues are, are responding and addressing the things that can um, that can be responded to in a way that's appropriate and in a way that's timely. That's important to do as well. 
Uh, no statements without actions. I think some of us, when we reflect back on the last couple of years of, um, you know, all the, the bias related acts that have happened nationally uh, and how many institutions have released statements of solidarity, right? We stand with uh, the Black community, right? We stand with, with the Jewish community and, and, and so on and so forth. And while most of these statements are well-intended, right? They're, they're released uh, for the right reasons. We, we've come to learn and understand is that most of them tend to be devoid of meaningful actions that the campus plans to take to address these issues. And so statements without actions are like unkept promises, right? They can, that could actually also trigger a race lighting response. And so it's important uh, as a campus, as an organization, if you're going to release a statement of solidarity, make sure that there's some meaningful actions that's contained within the statement and make sure that the appropriate follow through uh, and follow up occurs from those actions. Uh, proactive outreach is also another strategy that a campus can employ with regard to addressing race, racism and race lighting. Uh, proactively reaching out to communities, especially students who are targeted by acts of bias and racism will be important. So phone calls and other personalized contacts um, are some examples of what campuses can do in this regard. Uh, next slide. Uh, we often talk about building uh, what we have um, called an underground railroad. And this is essentially a network of race conscious educators whose students can be referred to to have their needs met and their concerns addressed. Right. And so it's important to know that who are who are our colleagues um, in some key areas, right, in our student services areas, in our academic units and so forth, that we can make appropriate referrals to that we know that when we send students there uh, or when we send colleagues there, that they'll be uh, addressed and dealt with and, um, you know, treated with, with dignity and the respect that they deserved. Uh, next, institutional leaders should routinely assess their campus climates with the goal of not only gaining a transparent understanding of what is occurring, but also how the campus climate is contributing to harm that is experienced by both students and educators. So there are many, many campus climates assessments out there. Um, and oftentimes what happens is uh, the climate is assessed, but we don't always get a sense of, you know, what harm or what damage has been done, right, with regard to how uh, the climate is experienced by people of color. And so it's important to do both. Um, we are, are really strong supporters and really believe in the work that Sean Harper does at the USC Center um, for Race and Ethnicity. Uh, they have the NAC, the National Assessment of Campus Collegiate Climates. Uh, for us, that's the gold standard when it comes to assessing campus climates. And so if anyone is interested in, in you know, identifying a tool or resource for doing that, we highly recommend that everyone takes a look at that, the work that's happening in uh, Sean Harper's shop. Uh, next, audits of campus policies that create and sustain inequity should also be incorporated into uh, campus planning processes. So this is important to do. And then finally, institutions should ensure that all students and educators have access to uh, individual counseling. And then um, also as an additive to that, group counseling can be used. Uh, and group counseling can be useful, particularly for communities that have been traditionally resistant or skeptical of individual therapy. So we think about the work that we do uh, on men of color, the three of us, uh, you know, Luke, Marissa, and myself, uh, on the work that we do on men of color, we have found that they tend to be a lot more responsive to, you know, having larger conversations with other men of color about the things that they're experiencing. And so with that, um, that takes us to the end of the framing uh, component of today's live session. And now for uh, the most exciting part, in my opinion, is our conversation with our colleague, Dr. Vasquez. And so uh, let's bring her in and we'll go from there. Hi, Marissa. Hi, good morning, afternoon, wherever folks are joining in from. What's up, Dr. V? Hello. Thank All you right. both for um, inviting me in this space. Absolutely. So if you can begin by kind of introducing yourself and uh, the, the research that you do um, and how it kind of connects to today's topic, and then we can we have some prepared questions for you as well. Um, yes. So uh, my professor um, at SDSU um, in secondary educational leadership. Um, I've had the 
um, privilege of, of being able to work um, alongside both my colleagues um, and, and brothers, um, Luke and Frank for, gosh, I don't even know. I feel like we're almost 10 years now. Um, and so I, um, I would say my research initially kind of evolved. It's evolved, but it really did begin with um, a lot of the work that we've um, done with, at SEAL and before M2C3, um, focusing on outcomes and experiences um, for um, men of color and particular within the community college context. And so I think within that, pro within this journey, um, it's kind of evolved into um, looking at experiences of transfer students. So I was a community college transfer student myself. And so um, looking at those pre and post transfer experiences and um, also exploring, you know, masculinities um, for Latino men in particular um, within these contexts. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think, I, you know, we'll echo a lot of what has already been shared with regards to, um, the the um, narratives that we've from our and, and partners at various institutions across the country with um, you know just racial microaggressions battle for this Dr. B, we're getting we're getting the lag. Um, we Luke, are you getting the lag on your end? Yeah. Uh, it could be it could be fail, oh, my bad. Is that better? You, you must you must be on campus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, I might have to keep my camera off. I apologize. Um, um so yeah, so I I, I you know I, I appreciate um you know the term race lighting because I I feel like everything that you've been sharing and, and the conversations you've been having around this term has really resonated, I think, with me personally, but also I think a lot of um, what we've been hearing from students, um, you know, whether it's through our, our research um, or just, you know, everyday interactions with our students on campus. So I'll stop, I'll pause there. Is there still a lag? No, that's much better. Okay. So, um, so Marissa, and if you could talk about, uh, in terms of the, the interviews and focus groups and extensive work that you've done with students, can you talk about evidence that you've seen of this race lighting experience and how you've seen it impact their learning growth development and kind of overall success? Yeah. Um, so so I, I feel like I can, I'm resonating more with the second half of that um, question with regards to the things that I've seen with our students. Um, you know, so something that I, I guess I kind of wanted to start with just unpacking what the term race lighting, as I, I've been sitting with it and trying to make sense of it for myself, it's, I, I can't help but like think about the term, I can't help, I can't, dis I guess, disassociate race and gender when it comes to this concept for for me and my own experiences um and so when i think about um the interactions that i've had or experiences that i've had sometimes i i question you know whether it's is it because i'm a woman or is it because i'm latina or is it because i'm both and so i think sometimes this you know i i really struggle with some of these interactions that have taken place and and um you know i think for me as an educator, it's been challenging, um, which I don't even know what a term is, but I'm sure, you know, I, I'm sure the two of you will come up with some kind of term to help explain this, but I feel like there's this, these moments where I hear my students um, sharing, you know, negative interactions with, you know, peers or colleagues in the classrooms, and because I feel that my own identities reflect many of those of my own students, it's almost like I take on their own experiences of race lighting, you know, and, and within the context of race and gender as well. Um, and it's like, and I internalize it. And for me, it's really hard because when I'm in these spaces with, with colleagues um, that are dismissive of our students and their experiences, it's almost like it's dismissing me in some way too. And so, um, so I, I have a really hard time with that. And so as I think about that, I, I, I hear, you know, um, you know, students having negative experiences 
with um, you know faculty in the classroom with making um, making either being dismissive or uh, making light of you know their lived experiences or narratives. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of what you've already shared about, you know, just questioning yourselves, like, is this, is it me, you know, or, you know, am I, am I going, am I crazy for thinking this? And I think because of that, it affects the, um, whether students actually come forward, you know, and, and being able to have a trusting faculty member that they can come to and, and share what their experiences are. And that definitely has been my experience, um. You know, with students is I feel like I, I tend to be the person that I don't know, I, I guess that students maybe feel comfortable with and, and sharing and expressing like this happened in the class, you know, and this happened with this other peer. Um, and so. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I feel like those are those have been some some, I guess, current experiences or more relevant experiences that I think about um, this concept and. And our, you know. Just, I guess, my professional work. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. No, it, 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 you perfectly did, and you hit on something that that I know that we hit on, uh, touched on the very first webinar the way we did on on race lighting, and I don't know how much we've emphasized it here, but that's around intersectionality, and really the multiple minoritized identities that a person has, we believe serves as an intensifying factor for um, this experience. So um, kind of through our background, we believe that uh, race and racism is central to the experiences of, of uh, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other people of color within our society. And so that serves as kind of a unifying framework for thinking about race lighting as an experience. But we know that um, that, that experience, that racialized identity, also has intersections with other forms of marginality, whether it's an identity as a, a female, an identity um, as a person with a disability, an identity as a religious minority, you can go on down the line. The intersections, the more multiple identities that are that are being um, embedded within that message serves as an intensifying factor that can make that race lighting experience be even more powerful in, in terms of making someone, again, have those experiences of second guessing themselves, uh, questioning their own thoughts and actions, their own contributions, their own place. And, and so I think how you frame that, it really brings together uh, what we know takes place really as the impact of gendered racism and how that leads to uh, racial microaggressions that are more complex and how that creates an even more complex race lighting experience. So appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you might wanna even touch upon this from the standpoint of your own uh, personal experience as well. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that prior, what I just shared was also, I think, it's all intersected, right? It's, there's sometimes it's really hard to separate what we are experiencing professionally with the personally, because I think I really, as someone put in the, the Q&A, the, the secondary traumatic stress, and I appreciate that language, because um, I feel like, yes, that's definitely what it feels like. And, um, oh, yes, add in ageism, too. I mean, not that I feel like I'm I mean, I think we're all still young, but I'm like, yeah, when I was, when I first started here, I definitely looked a lot younger. Um, and so I think that also played a role. Uh, um, I, I'll turn on my camera a little bit, see if it doesn't lag, but, um, but, you know, I think there, um, there is an incident that I feel I carry with me continuously, even though it happened like eight years ago. Um, and I know it's a, it's an experience that I know that, um, that both of you are familiar with. Um, and I think it was, you know, in thinking about when this happens, to, you know, and when, when race lighting happens to us, who do we go to? Um, I might have to turn my camera back off, but, um, you know, like who, who do we go to and wh where can we go? And it's really important. And, and I, I'm just very grateful that I have colleagues um, that, can talk to and so because I, I so when I first started off you know a professor I remember my very first day of class I was I was excited but I was nervous um you know we teach I teach graduate level um and so you know I was I was eight years younger and I looked eight years younger and so um I already knew that, that I was coming in with a little bit of anxiety thinking like okay are they going to take me seriously um 
And what is that going to mean? You know, how do I, how am I going to show up? Right. So I'm already coming into the space, second guessing everything about myself, about what I'm going to say, how I'm going to speak, what I'm going to wear, um, you know, what type of interactions and relationships do I want to, uh, you know, have a foundational for my students. And, um, you know, I think, I think something that happened that day, um, I had a, I had a white male student um, who had made a comment at some point. We were about to break for lunch, and um, he said something in front of the, in front of class. And in the moment, I really didn't know what to say, but I just felt like the anxiety and like my heart was pounding. And um, and he was like, you know, we're we're really lucky um, to not only have a professor that knows what she's talking about, but that's also nice to look at. And so. Um, so I, and I, I just remember not really knowing what to say or do in that moment. Um, but I just remember the power dynamics in that room and in that space, right. As the faculty, but also feeling that I was young, that I was a woman of color and, you know, my student was much older, was a white man who was, a you know, senior level administrator at, at a college. Um, and so I, I kind of just froze and I just remember the first I, I had to stru really struggle through the day, the rest of the day to get through that. And um, I just felt so like icky, you know, just being in class and having to kind of bear through it all um, and act like nothing had happened. Um, and it, immediately after the class ended, um, uh, I, I called Luke <laughs> and I was crying, you know, and I was like, I was upset. It still bothered there's me to this day. Um, but I just remember like all these feelings were just rushing to, to me. I was like, was it me? Did I do something wrong? Like, did I say something wrong? Did I inappropriately? Did I, was I too playful? Did I, you know, what did I do? So, you know, was it, and just, I mean, I really struggled with that and not just that, but I felt like I had to go home to my partner. And there was just so much shame that I had, that what I was carrying in me because I kept questioning, like, was this, was this something that I did? Um, and I, I just remember coming home and feeling like I couldn't even tell him about it because I felt so ashamed by what I could have potentially been, had done. And so, so that was kind of the first part. And then I just remember talking to Luke and talking through it out and saying, like, you know, what do I do? And, um, you know, and he was like, well, let's, let's take it to our, our um, our department, you know, um, and I, I just, I felt like I didn't get the re the response that I really was hoping for. Again, I felt like I was race lighted and, and made to feel, I, it was really dismissed. Um, when I, when I addressed it with, um, with some individuals, it was again, and, and these were non-people of color. Um, I, it was, it was dismissed as, oh, that used to happen all the time with our other colleagues are, you know, they get hit on all the time and it's no big deal. And, oh, you know, it's just, and I just remember again, sitting there thinking like, okay, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. Maybe it was just me. Right. But I just, I, um, I like for me, I think what, what was most important for me was having the safety of my, of my colleagues, the, the two of you, um, to know that I could go to you, but I, I recognize that not everyone, not everyone has that. Um, and so when I think about implications, right, I think what Frank had, you've already shared, right, is, is to, um, to not just listen, but also just like, don't dismiss and, and acknowledge that, you know, this is, um, this is definitely something that's relevant and that it's happening. And um, yeah, so I think that's just something that for me, you know, as one one incident of of several, I think, but that's the one that I've I've carried with me, right? And I think about going back to that that traumatic, that post-traumatic stress of it all, the fact that it still makes my voice shake when I tell that story today is the impact of that long-term effect of race lighting, of microaggressions, of um racial battle fatigue. And so it's it's not just some, a one-time incident, right? It's something that affects, that could affect someone um, for many years. Yeah, Dr. V, thank, thank you for sharing. I know that was not easy to kind of talk through. I, I remember that situation. Um, 
And while you were sharing, I, you know, I, I was listening, looking at some of the uh, responses in the Q and A, uh, and a lot of a lot of colleagues are asking, you know, what do you do in these situations, right? How do you how do you not just survive in these situations, but how do you thrive in these situations? You know, the three of us are professors at a research university where the expectations for your productivity are incredibly high, and you know, if you don't meet those expectations there are there's some real negative career implications mm -hmm. so how do you do this and how do you work how do you achieve at a level that exceeds expectations because we know as you know people of color we, we have to exceed expectations while dealing with you know this trauma um and, you know william smith uh, when you talk about the this sort of still feeling the effects of this years later that's the the battle fatigue right that's that's why william smith who was with us last week describe racism as an act of violence, right? Because the, the response, the trauma response that you have to it is one that is akin to what occurs when you experience an act of violence. And so I, I know for me, I think the fact that the three of us are in the same department at the same university and that even when the university, even when you know other colleagues haven't always understood and responded in a way that we've we would have liked, the fact that we've had the three of us that we can kind of co coach each other through these issues have, has been has been uh, incredibly valuable. I know for me personally and professionally, and so I'm always mindful about colleagues who don't have a Luke or a Marissa, you know, down the hall. And you know, what do they? What, what do they do? Right? How do they work through these situations? And so we talk about radical self care, right? We talk about transitioning and identifying spaces. If you, like, for example, if you know you're in a department, not saying that this is the case in our department, but if you're in a department that's racially toxic, you have to, you know, spend as little time as necessary there and, and, and spend more time in places that are culturally affirming, right? Uh, we talk about self-care. I know all three of us, we've, you know, we've all been on a fitness journey the last, you know, few years. And I noticed that we prioritize our, our health and wellness, our physical health and wellness and not more, a lot more than we used to. And being mm -hmm. unapologetic about that and not feeling bad about that. And I know that as men of color, you know, Luke and I, we would get, you know, far fewer questions or pushback about that than you would as a woman of color, Marissa. And so we know again, right, when we talk about marginality and intersectionality and how that all comes into play and kind of complicates what we're talking about. But, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, really think about colleagues at other institutions and, you know, are, are there networks that could be formed, um, you know, for colleagues who don't have other folks on their campuses or in their departments that could help help them through these issues? It's, you know, these are, these are big questions. Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of, yeah, self-care, I think well, one, you know, I think one thing I've appreciated from the two of you is, is me being able to come to you and express, like, even when the three of us have been in conversations and where I feel like I've been dismissed or ignored, <laughs> um, you know, and I think the fact that the two of you have always um, have had my back, I think, where it's just like, let's just say we were being invited to go do a presentation right and I'm in the room and it's like yeah Luke and Frank you two will be on the panel and right. you know and I'm sitting there and, and and I'm grateful that Luke and Frank are like yeah that's great but Marissa should be here too and so um so I think having colleagues that advocate for you even when you are not in the room and even when you're in the room um has been really just instrumental and and um I think, yeah, I think the two of you have definitely lifted me through my, you know, just through a lot of, of my journey. Um, you know, I, I, um, I would say, yeah, the, the fitness, um, thing, <laughs> uh, y'all see my Instagram posts. So, um, yeah, I think working out, you know, has definitely been one of those, um, self-care moments and unapologetic moments for myself, you know, and, and, um, I kind of just, I, I though, though that's, that's one thing that I've told my, for myself, right. If I am not well enough for me, I, then I'm not going to be good for anyone else. And so that's been really important for me, um, recently. And, um, you know, I, I and Dr. Navi, I'm sorry, not, 
not to not to interrupt, but I also want to be mindful. Dr. V, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Before before you go out, I, I want to be mindful. We, we may have colleagues who are not, you know, for, for, for whatever reason, you know, health the reasons that may not be able to physically oh, right. work, so work out, out as a strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure we're also talking about other things that that we oh absolutely yeah sorry i didn't mean to interrupt yeah no no and i think um you know one thing i do is i color um i i had to i started coloring during my and i had that um my concussion but that's something that i think has been very just therapeutic for me is i'll sit in color even if it's during meetings i feel like i'm breaking in and out i apologize no i think um, you're good now yeah but, yeah, you know, or just or having you know conversations with with family or spending time with family, um, whether it's your you know whoever family is for you. Um, I cry. <laughs> the two of you know I'm a crier, oh, yeah. um, but crying is like a good stress relief for myself and doing that. Um, but I, I definitely say it's I've been uplifted by a, a you know an entire network of colleagues and friends, um, you know that have. Yeah, just just not not just at San Diego State, but across other institutions. And I think that um, has been helpful, right? Seeing Frank's motivational quotes on Instagram, <laughs> that's that's always good. So I think when I see people thriving and at their best, that's what makes me feel good. Um, and that's what also motivates me to like keep going. And so um, I, I'm mindful of time, so I don't, I'll kind of pause here. Well, I know that there's a, um, a few questions that have come up in the in the chat window. Um, so before I, I go to some of those, I just want to note that, Marissa, there's a, a many um, people expressing appreciation for uh, your vulnerability and and authenticity around this issue. Um, I'll also note that um, that we find that illuminating the importance of race lighting often means you have to provide examples, right? where and which is difficult right you have to oftentimes expose uh, uh, personal experiences that aren't um, particularly you know positive um, for those who are willing to to do so um, you can shoot um, either myself or, or frank an email and we can then begin as we continue to talk about this topic incorporate uh, narratives and stories we would do so in a way that maintains your confidentiality never is specific enough where it could um, uh, be tracked back to you, but we oftentimes find that it can be very compelling. So please feel free to email us. Um, and I've, I've already received a few why we've been here in this session and and they're, they're very powerful. So encourage others to do the same. Uh, I, there's a really interesting question in here, that, um, Frank uh, and Marissa around what what do you do when the person that you would go to about these issues is a person of color and they also don't believe you? Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that that happens, right? So sometimes we can be complicit in our own oppression. Number one, mm -hmm. number two, sometimes um, just because of the way that systemic racism works we can sort of buy into the idea that if one of us is not success, there's only like success for people of color is a zero sum proposition. So there's only room and space for one of us to make it. And so, you know, as a person of color, if, if, if I, if, if Luke makes it, then that means Marissa and I can't write it. So there could be, you know, some sort of professional jealousy that works against us. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, I, that can be, that can almost feel feel like a double whammy, right? It's, it's not only you're being race lit, but you're being race lit by somebody who looks like you and who shares your identity. And so, you know, I, I just think I, I, in some ways I would handle it and try to make sense of it in the same way that I would if it wasn't a person of color, right? Just sort of recognizing and understanding that this is the, this is the result of institutional racism this is how it's it's always worked, right? Uh, I try not to personalize things, although I know these are deeply personal issues, and it's hard not to. But I really, again, I, and I think with race lighting, this is this is really important, regardless of who's race lighting you. The whole idea is to not internalize it, to not question ourselves, to not doubt ourselves, um, to not question how do we get here, 
you know, what are we contributing, right? It's just really countering those negative messages that tend to creep in, even when it's, you know, whether it's, you know, person of color, you know, or a white identified person that's doing it. Um, it's, it's sort of the way that I, I try to make sense of those experiences, but that could be, that could be really challenging. Absolutely. So we have a uh, time for maybe w one more question and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, if um, maybe all three of us can respond to it and then, uh, and before we close out, uh, yeah. Frank, is there a particular one that stands out to you? Otherwise I'll, I'll pick. Um, no, 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 just pick one. I, I've, I've had a hard time, you know, Marissa's story generated so many responses. I've kind of had a hard time keeping up. So yeah, pick one and uh, we can go with that. Absolutely. Um, so uh, th this question uh, really is focused on how do we, because we have made, re made a recommendation about identifying spaces that people can transition to that are you know, safer and more, more healing. What are some examples that people should be looking for and what are some of the like kind of characteristics of those spaces? Yeah, I mean, a big part of this, it's it's the individuals, it's the people that are within spaces that make a space affirming or or, or not affirming. And so identify, identify spaces where you have like-minded colleagues who value you, who believe in you, and who actually tell you that they value you and that they believe in you and that they love your work and, you know, all the things that we all, we all need, you know, validation uh, in our in our professional work and professional lives. And so I think that that's one characteristic of it. Um, and, and this is it doesn't mean that it's, it's going to be exclusively people of color in these spaces. Right. Um, you know, you, you can have colleagues who identify as white that are race conscious that get it. And that could also be affirming. And so I think that's what I would tend to look for and gravitate to. And then Marissa, what about you? What do you think in terms of either um, what you'd recommend to others or what you've done personally? Um, you know, I just, I, I'm thinking about um, one of my doctoral students and I wanna give her credit for this. Her name's Naomi um, Ramirez. And so, you know, we have a research team and, you know, we kind of talked about like this because sometimes you might not find spaces, right? So sometimes it's, you just have to create these spaces for yourself and for, you know, your department, for your team, where it might be. And so, you know, we've been, we started exploring this idea of collaborative autoethnography as spaces for healing. And, um, you know, it kind of just begins with us. We, you know, kind of came up with some prompts, some general prompts about what is really helping us understand and unpack our experiences. And so, sorry, my dog, my, one of the experience, one of the questions are, you know, what systems and structures within academia perpetuate stress and fatigue? Um, how to situate my identity, my academic professional. Personal. So we collaboratively came up with a few questions and then we took time to answer, to answer them. And um, and we responded to them individually, and then we came back and responded to them collectively. And then we, we, we told ourselves is that when we respond to these, we're not limiting ourselves to responding to them in a written way or an oral narrative way, but, you know, in whatever way that you want to express it. So, you know, some of us expressed it through poetry or through, you know, singing or through, um, you know, drawing. And so, I think just thinking, you know, I, I know academia tends has tend to pull the the creativity out of us um, in some, you know, just the artistic for me, definitely, um, just I think because I've been so prescribed to fitting a mold. Right. And so that definitely has been very healing um, for our for each other and, and then kind of just learning a little bit more about ourselves and, and who we are in the group. So I guess I'll offer that. And then I guess I would say a few things. One, I think the space needs to be one where there's a shared identity. So if we're talking about race lighting, right, it's about your racialized identity. But then we also mentioned those intersections with other forms of marginality. So it's spaces where there's individuals who are most likely to experience the kind of challenges, uh, at least patterns of those challenges that you experience. Uh, and then within those spaces, it has to be one of those um, places where there's it's safe for authentic discourse where you can truly have authentic conversations about what's going on without fear of retribution, without worrying that someone is gonna take what you said and share it publicly with others. 
And then the third thing that I would say is it has to be one where there's encouragement because the nature of race lighting is one where it fills your messages, uh, your mind with messages that aren't true and you need someone to counteract it. So if you're being treated with distrust, disdain and disregard, you need uh, a space that extols your brilliance, your dignity and your morality. So it has to be a counter space that, that, that sends those positive messages to counteract all those negative messages you may, you may be experiencing. And then, so I would just say in terms of closing, and I'll, uh, I'll also um, provide uh, my colleagues with the opportunity to close, that when you're experiencing um, these issues, just remember, it's not you, it's them. You aren't being too sensitive. You are not alone. You, the, you are more than enough. You are worthy. You are intelligent. You are capable. And you are deserving of good. And I know for the sake of time, I'm out and, you know, Dr. Vasquez is our invited guest. So I'll yield with, with little time I have to, to her. No, I'll, I'll be quick. I just, I, I feel Luke, your, your words were, were enough, you know, and I, I appreciate, I think, I think being in this space for everyone that's even here, all 900 and I think there was a thousand people here, right? I think this in itself is a counter space. And the fact that we've been here in community with each other and have been able to you know, um, kind of just reflect and, and be in support of each other, I think has been valuable. So um, I appreciate that. Well, as always, thank you all for attending. And we will be following up with uh, additional resources and information via email. You always know how to reach out to us. We appreciate your support of the work over these sessions and all the sessions that we've done prior to. And thank you to our special guest, Dr. Marissa Vasquez. Have a wonderful day, everyone.